So during Advent, we have many traditions, but we are pilgrim, so we'd like to add a little twist to our traditions. One of our traditions is to light candles. And this year we are doing the Advent candle lighting slightly differently. I invite those of you who have candles to come forward, light them using the one candle in the middle, and place them in the sand. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading to Christmas and reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church has always used that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks to a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming, always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. So today we light the first candles, the candles of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and the well-being of all creation. as when a crop has been put in the ground 
and the farmer scans the sky looking for signs of rain. The purpose of watching and waiting is to be ready when the time comes. During this uh, reading of the passage from Matthew, I invite you to imagine that the day will come when you are in the right place at the right time. When something needs to be done, that you're the person for the job. When you realize that you have exactly what somebody else needs. Or when you recognize that a dream of your heart is about to come true. Matthew 24, verse 36, beginning and ending with 44. But about that day and hour no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them away. So too will be the coming of the Son of Man. When two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an unexpected hour. The word of God for the people of God.
So today, as you've heard, is the first day of the season of Advent. And it's probably pretty obvious that Advent isn't like most other seasons. It's not one of the seasons of nature. It doesn't even have a particular weather association. It's not a big commercial season. Like, you know, those holidays that used to be a single day, but now are several weeks long, as indicated by the seasonal sale that precedes them. Halloween, 4th of July, Thanksgiving. You could argue that Advent doesn't get a lot of mainstream media attention because it's a religious season, but then how would you explain Easter and Christmas? They're also uh, arguably two of the goalposts of the Christian tradition, yet they're also two of the biggest secular celebrations we have in the United States. Even Lent gets more mainstream media attention than Advent. Despite Lent's traditional focus on giving up things versus Advent's focus on waiting for things. I think that part of Advent's low profile is due to its close proximity to Christmas. When you think about even how we talk about Advent, it's often in relationship to Christmas. We describe it as the four weeks before Christmas. Our Advent calendars are a countdown to Christmas. And we all know how crazy things get when we start preparing for Christmas, which we're encouraged to do earlier and earlier every year. This year, I think the Christmas music on Light FM started the day after Halloween. The city of Chicago's Christmas tree lighting celebration, complete with carols and a visit from Santa Claus, was on November 22nd. And many major retailers started their Black Friday Christmas sales on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Basically, we start celebrating Christmas before Advent even begins. And once we start celebrating Christmas, we barely have time to catch our breath. Expectations tend to run high, so there's decorations to put up, cards to send, gifts to buy, family recipes to prepare, traditions to uphold. Plus, it's a great time of joy and fellowship, so there are many opportunities to gather with friends, attend holiday parties, Christmas concerts, travel to visit relatives, or prepare to host them in our homes. When you think about all that needs to get done, do we really have time for a season of Advent? I mean, if it's really just a period of Christmas preliminaries, do we really need it? As long as we're ready for Christmas, haven't we kind of done Advent already? <coughs> now, I'm hoping that you recognize those as rhetorical questions. <laughs> and that we do need Advent. Because Advent isn't just pre-Christmas. It's a word by itself that is unrelated to even churchy issues. It means the anticipation, the waiting, the anticipation of something grand and important that is coming. Advent proclaims the coming of the Lord, which is actually different from and much more than saying that Christmas is coming. On this first day, of this first Sunday of Advent, it's also the first day of a new church year, and we are called to direct our attention to the future to the future that God promised to our ancestors, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, and to us. A promise that was reiterated repeatedly by the prophets of ancient times, and a vision that still today sustains those that work to take us beyond the world as we know it to the world of what could be. A vision of global peace, and justice and well-being, God's reign, God's kingdom, here on earth. Advent joins the personal and the political. It is a time for hopes and dreams, for provocative possibilities. In this season, we are at the brink of something utterly new, long yearned for, but far beyond our capacity to enact. Advent invites us to rouse ourselves 
out of the predictability of our lives and our routines to look up from our to-do lists and prepare ourselves to receive with eagerness and joy the unexpected, improbable, unimaginably amazing new thing that God is doing. Which brings us to the challenge of Advent. How does one adequately prepare for something that you've been waiting for and hoping for, but you're not sure when it's going to come? For me, the anticipation, waiting, and uncertainty of Advent will be forever associated with my experience of waiting for the birth of my first child. Back in those days, gender reveal parties were not yet a fashionable thing. And so Bruce and I spent several months getting our homes and our lives ready to meet our new child without knowing specifically if we were waiting on a she or a he, nor when he or she would arrive. I was working full time at a job that required frequent travel, so I started my maternity leave a few weeks before my due date, just to be sure that I would be ready when the baby decided to arrive. Now in the beginning of my leave, I was quite busy making last minute preparations, stockpiling newborn sized diapers and sleepers in neutral colors of yellow and green putting the finishing touches on the nursery, making sure that my hospital bag was packed and the advanced grocery shopping was done so that everything would be ready when we came home. But as the weeks wore on with no baby in sight, I sort of slipped back into my normal routine. And at about 41 and a half weeks, my, daughter, my doctor told me that we were going to induce labor on a particular date because things just didn't seem to be moving along naturally. Though I was a bit bummed about feeling like I needed the extra help, I have to admit I was pretty relieved. Now that I knew the baby's arrival schedule, I could relax and wait. So I turned my attention to getting ready for Halloween. I think this was the first year in the neighborhood where we were expecting a lot of trick-or-treaters, so we wanted the house to be festive, and we wanted to make sure that we had enough good candy to impress our neighbors. The trick-or-treaters started coming late afternoon, which was no problem since I was home on leave. And in the beginning, things were going pretty smoothly. But soon the back and forth of going to the door was leaving me short of breath. And then my stomach started to cramp, which was kind of annoying, but I assumed it was related to the candy I was sampling, because we had the good candy. Eventually, my back started to hurt, so I pulled a chair over to the door and sat near it so I wouldn't have to keep getting up and down to answer the door. I also tried drinking water to settle my stomach, but it seemed that no matter what I did, the pain just kept getting worse. <laughs> Finally, after about two hours of this, I recalled that earlier in the day, when I had been out shopping at the mall, a few people had asked me if I was okay because occasionally I stopped to grab a rack when I felt a sharp pain. I had assumed it was the baby just moving into an awkward position and kept shopping. But now as my pain intensified to the point that it reminded me of the worst monthly cramps I had ever experienced, it finally dawned on me. I was in labor. It's a lot harder to figure that out than it probably sounds. For the first time. And so in hindsight, it's pretty embarrassing that it took me so long to figure that out. And I'm very grateful that Bruce was able to make it home from work in time to get me to the hospital so that we didn't have Jonathan on the side of the road. And my problem wasn't so much that I didn't know the signs of labor, but rather that I wasn't expecting to be in labor, so I wasn't paying attention to the rather obvious signs of what was occurring. I had become complacent because I thought I knew when the baby was coming. In our Gospel text today, Jesus is speaking to his followers who have been waiting for a very, very, very long time for the messianic prophecies of the Hebrew scriptures to be fulfilled. And the community to whom the Gospel of Matthew was addressed would have been waiting even longer. There's a deep longing, then and now, for the fulfillment of God's promises, well-being in a world 
that has been healed, blessed, and cared for, global justice and peace, the people cry out in hope and anguish, how long, O oh God? There is a strong belief in the promise, but equally strong desire to know specifically when it will be fulfilled. Jesus redirects their energy away, though, from timetables and schedules, first by telling them that no one, not even he, knows the exact timing and second, by giving them clear instructions on how the faithful are to behave in view of this uncertainty. They are to be watchful, awake and mindful, prepared and ready. This call for watchfulness is conveyed in today's text with three different sharp, intrusive, and disturbing images and emphasis all three, though, reinforcing the same message. The catastrophe of the great flood is used as an analogy. Noah is contrasted with his contemporaries who simply assumed that business as usual would continue forever. Their lives were comprised of seemingly endless series of repeated activities, leaving them neither time nor reason to face the future. Noah didn't have any great insider information, but he acted on the word of God and built a boat. His orientation was toward the future, and so he was prepared while his neighbors were not. The image of one taken and one left points to the suddenness of the arrival of the unexpected, as well as the permanence of the transformation that begins. As soon as we understand that God is already present among us and that we are collaborators in divine disruption of the status quo, nothing will ever be the same as it was before. The parable of the householder who is burglarized because he lacks vigilance warns us against being lulled into a false sense of security by savoring the present to the detriment of a future-oriented existence. The householder failed to watch, to pay attention. The season of Advent invites us to simply pay attention, to look up from the busyness of our holiday preparations and our relentless daily routines, to look up from our phones and away from our screens, Holy moments may catch you by surprise, so be prepared to encounter Jesus in both expected and unexpected places. At work or school, at the grocery store, restaurant, movie theater, post office, perhaps on the L or the Metro or the entrance to the expressway, in a hospital, a prison, maybe even a church. Jesus' words challenge us to live faithfully, to live a lifestyle of expectancy, to live as if God is with us precisely because God is. And God is always up to something good, always seeking to bless and create and restore and bring hope to the chaotic messes of our lives and the dark corners of our fears and hurts. Advent bids us to stop, to breathe, to consider the marvels of creation, of each other, and of the divine presence that infuses every molecule of the cosmos. Pay attention, be ready. Christ's coming is now. Amen. God be with you.